Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. In good measure, press down, shaken together, running over, it will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure that you receive. God add his blessing for the reading of this word. Well, we've heard survey after survey that shows it to be true. The number one cause of conflict between couples, in families, among people that are living together as roommates, the number one source of conflict is money. And certainly we can understand that. We may have some of those conflicts in our past. Some questions that seem so small can explode into such big battles like questions like, how often should we go out to eat? Can we or can we afford this new car that we need? And of course, even how much should we give to the church? All of these can be sources of conflict and so many others. These little questions that come up each and every day about how we spend our money, about how we use our money. Of course, money is not only a source of anxiety for people in families, people uh, who are married, people who are living uh, with, with a roommate. There are also sources of conflict for those who are living alone. For anyone can have money issues, money difficulties that can come up from time to time. Any person can face some moment of financial crisis, and there are a few things in this world that can cause us such anxiety and such worry as worries about money. Well, good spiritual and emotional health being important to us all, being something that God wants for each and every one of us, it does benefit us to think about and understand the role of money in our lives. And this isn't always easy. Because money is a great deceiver. Money can be like some pie piper playing a tune, seeking to convince us that the answer to all of our problems that we are having is simply to get more money. Just a little bit more. Well, it doesn't take long to show that that is wrong because, you know, we all have more. We live even in this country, this culture of such abundance. We have so much more than half of the people in this world who live on just a few dollars a day. If more money were the answer to all our problems, then we would be the happiest and most prosperous uh, country personally uh, in the world. And we know that that just is not so. We have as many worries as anyone else. More money, yes, money does want to deceive us into thinking that more is what we need. And Jesus spoke of this, didn't he? The parable of the rich fool, the man who had plenty, had more than he needed, but continued going on in his life in the single-minded pursuit of one thing, and that was more. If I can just get more, I will be happy. And on and on it goes in his life until finally he passed from this earth. And he left behind all the opportunities he had in life to give something of himself to something other than the acquisition and acquiring of more money. It's particularly true in our culture. If it was true in Jesus' day, isn't it even more so today? Because we hear over and over again, if you can just buy this thing, you will be happy. If you can just get this thing, you will be satisfied in life. What a lie that is. What a deception to think that the next thing that we get, that we purchase, is going to make us happy. We know it's a lie because it's never worked in the past, and yet it's easy to continue to let money deceive us into thinking that acquiring more is the answer. No wonder there are so many people in this world. No wonder all of us from time to time 
feel so dissatisfied with all of these messages that are coming to us, saying that if we could just get something else, we would be happy. And certainly the implication there is that if we don't have it, we won't be happy. We can't be happy. But we know, again, in our minds, as we reason it out, that more money isn't going to make us happy. We can see that in the statistics and the surveys. Because if that were so, then wouldn't the most affluent among us be the ones who never had to argue about money, who never had conflicts about it? And yet the surveys show that in the most affluent families, arguments about money are even more frequent. Isn't that amazing? We think that if we just had enough, money lies and deceives us into thinking if we just had enough, if we just had a little bit more, we would be happy. In fact, you know, the studies show that an increase of money coming into the house, a raise by some member, uh, some member of the household gets a raise, <laughs> that that is actually going to cause more conflict than someone getting a pay cut in the house. Money is a great deceiver. Deceives us into thinking that if we could just get a little bit more of it, we would be happy, and that would solve all of our problems. It's like a mirage that it holds out there before us, and we walk, and we walk, and we walk toward it, thinking if we can just get there, and yet the mirage always stays just out of reach. Always more to get until satisfaction can be felt, and that satisfaction never, ever comes. Well, if we can avoid this in our life, we can keep money from deceiving us in so many ways that it has to deceive us. Then actually, we can do something else with money. We can have another relationship with money. Instead of money as a deceiver, we can have money as a servant. Money makes an excellent servant. It's like Clint said today about his father, money is a tool that we can use. And it's a great servant, but how, how do we put it into action? How do we make it work for us? Well, one thing we have to do is to be wise in the ways we use it, because money itself won't solve our problems. We may be starving to death, and a big pile of money in front of us is not going to help us. We may be freezing, and a big pile of money isn't going to help us there either. What helps us is putting that money to use. Making that money into our servant. If we are hungry then, if we are starving, to take some of that money and to spend it wisely on food. If we are cold, then to take that money and spend it wisely to bring warmth into our homes. To use our money. To use it and make it into our servant. Because money can be an incredible servant. Great things can be done to the proper use of money. But money makes a terrible master, an awful master, a vindictive master. This is especially true in our lives when we're faced some moment in our lives, perhaps by choice, perhaps not by choice, when we have to spend more money than we make. Oh, and then money truly becomes our master at that point. Money truly causes us to do all sorts of things that we would never normally do. Money wants us to fight with each other at home. And so, since money is our master, we fight. Money wants us to cheat, and so cheat we do. Money wants us to lie, and so yes, we lie as well. A harsh master indeed money can be. And it can move us this way and that way at will. But if we choose, if we are wise, we can make money into our servant. The uh, founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, had a very simple teaching to the members of his congregation about their use of money. And it's like many simple things, it rings so true, it's so wise. He said this, he said, look at your, how much you make and take 80% of that, 80% and spend it. 
Spend it on all the things that you require, all the things that you need. And if you had some left over there, then spend that joyfully on what you want to have. 80% on the things we need and the things we want. And then he said, take 10% and save it. Save it. It's a part of stewardship we don't talk about enough here in the church. The importance of saving a portion of our money. This is money that we will use. It's still money for us, but it's money for needs that are going to come someday. So we take 80% and we spend it. We take 10% and we save it. And then with that last 10%, we give it away. We give it. And that way, money becomes our servant and not our master. Money does what we tell money to do instead of us doing what money requires of us. Well, I like this. I like the simplicity of it. I love the part about, about spending 80%. That's great. Figure out how much you have to spend and then spend it and spend it joyfully. I like the part about saving. Saving 10%. That's wonderful. And again, something we don't talk about enough as a part of stewardship that Jesus talked about as well. The importance of saving. And then the 10% on spending. Now that is our on giving. And I like that too. That's good. That is a, a guideline we Christians can understand. We call it a tithe of our income. But what I prefer is what Jesus taught us too. Keeping that 10% in mind, we hear and understand that Jesus taught us to keep, to give regularly. That is, make giving a part of our lives and make a habit of in our lives, whether it's weekly or monthly or yearly, we make ha a giving into a habit. We give regularly. We give proportionately. The more we have, the more resources at hand, the more we should give. We give, Jesus taught us, sacrificially. That means more than a token gift, a gift we really feel, a gift that has real meaning to us. And finally, we give joyfully. We give joyfully, and joyfully it should be, because the money we give, we give it in ways where it goes to do God's work, where it goes to strengthen others in our community. And so that should make us happy, but it also should make us happy with great joy that we are making money into our servant. We do these things, and money serves us. And we are not money's master. We see this and feel it trickling down in our lives as well. Our use of money, our philosophy for money, our worldview about money has a way of affecting all of our behavior. It has a way of touching on everything else we do in life, even things that don't seem related exactly to money. Perhaps this is why Jesus spent so much time teaching us about how we should spend and use and save and give of our resources. The number one subject Jesus spoke of during his ministry was the kingdom of God, and the number two thing was stewardship. The use of our money, because Jesus knew that how we use our money affects every part of our life. How important that is to know and to remember that our values, all of our values, are touched and determined by our value in this one area, how we use our money. Values are so important. The things, uh, one, actually one of the most important things that we pass on in our lives. We pass on to others around us. We pass on to children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, anybody who our life touches. Anyone who sees our values is influenced by it. Jesus spent a lot of time, again, talking about the importance of money because it has a profound effect on our values. I remember uh, hearing a story about a woman whose friend, oh, well, you know how uh, during a time when you go know, into a loss, sometimes people say just the right things, and sometimes they say just the wrong things. And she experienced that, this woman, when her father passed away. It was right after the funeral. They were actually walking from the graveside, and her friend was walking with her, and her friend, uh, on the way back to the car, from the graveside, 
asked her, so how much did your father leave you? Can you imagine that? Well, it shocked her. And it shocked her into thinking, well, what did my father leave? And she thought about it. I thought, well, you know, he didn't leave me much in material resources. Not a lot of money, not a lot of property. A lot of abundance of values he gave me. So here is this abundance of values that he imparted to this woman during her life. And she had that, and she had all the memories of him, and that was a wonderful legacy indeed. Well, think again of the story of the rich, the foolish uh, man, the rich fool. Think of his funeral, and then afterwards, his, in, uh, his children, or his, uh, uh, those who were inheriting his money, coming and hearing the bill. And what was that like? Well, he certainly had lots of property to give and to leave to them. Lots and lots. He spent his life building these huge barns. They were given more wealth than they would ever, ever be able to use. But what values were they given? <laughs> well, certainly, they were given the value of desiring bigger and bigger and bigger barns all of their lives. What a sad value that is to leave behind. It's something for us all to consider. When it comes to our values, what are we leaving behind? And how does money and our use of money and our philosophy of money, our spiritual beliefs about money affect everything else? Well, studies show that they, it does. It touches everything else in our lives. It touches everything else that we do. All of our moral decisions. There was a uh, a survey that was put out in the magazine Psychology Today. And it was a long survey. The point of the survey, they were hoping that readers would fill it out and mail it back to them because they were trying to figure out, you know, how ethical are Americans? And that's their audience, Americans. So how ethical is the average person? They wanted uh, people to fill out this lengthy survey with scores and scores of questions, all the kind of questions you may have seen in the survey before. You know, uh, if you scratch somebody's car, would you leave a note? Uh, would you cheat on your income tax? Would you take sick leave without actually being sick? Just these little normal, everyday ethical dilemmas that come our way, and people were asked to, uh, to write in what they would do, and they were also asked, many other personal questions to see if there was something that affected ethics. What was it that made people ethical or less likely to be ethical? Well, they got 24,000 responses to this survey. They tabulated out all of the results, and the folks at Psychology Today were surprised that the number two, way up there, the number two determinant whether or not a person lived an ethical life was the amount of their religious conviction, their attendance in church, their belief in God. And I think that surprised the folks in psychology today, thinking that the pews are full of people that, yes, maybe say one thing, but act in a different way when they're away from church. But actually, that wasn't the case. And doesn't that make us feel good about what we do here today? What we do as a community of faith, it makes a difference. Our belief in God makes a difference and should in the way we live our lives. In the ethical choices that we make each and every day. But there was one thing. One thing that was even a greater determinant whether a person acted ethically or whether a person did not act ethically. That was this. It was the amount of money that that person gave away. Gave to charity. Whether or not they were religious or not, did not matter. The number one determinant was how generous they were with their money. If they were, they tended to be much more ethical in the way they lived their lives. That was what was the number one way to predict whether a person would be ethical or not. This surprised a lot of people, too, religious people, but also secular people as well. And this was the number one determinant. And I'll tell you, it was in the Bible, and it has been, and we've seen it over and over again. The more likely a person is to hold on, not let it go, to not join with their neighbors, with their community, 
in giving to things that are important, in giving in ways that make a difference. People hold on to their money and refuse to do it, but their values are affected by it. And all the little decisions that they make each and every day. Values in general are reflected by our use of money. This is a good reason to give long and careful consideration in how generous we will be because it will touch the rest of our lives and those around us will see it and they will be affected as well by the values that we hold. So listen, don't let money deceive you. Instead, make money your servant by spending it on what you need today, by saving it for what you will need tomorrow, and by giving it away regularly, sacrificially, proportionately, and joyfully. Do this, and money will never, <coughs> ever be your master. Let us bow. Eternal Father, even as we thank you for all the great material gifts we have received, we ask you to help us to use these gifts wisely and well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, if you are looking for a church home today, I would invite you to come forward now during the singing of our hymn of invitation and join with this church by confessing your faith in Jesus. Christ, or by transferring your membership. <laughs> Let us all stand out together.